we are a uh, classical liberal public policy think tank and we usually weigh into domestic public policy issues such as economics, education and culture but we occasionally delve into uh, foreign policy debates and as it happens we're not just having a foreign policy debate this evening we're also having uh, a chance to launch a new program called China and Free Societies. It's a pilot program for six to nine months and we want to raise awareness about China and um, the extent to which it uh, poses threats to domestic sovereignty. Now, China has been in the news a lot, obviously, in the last few months and last year especially. In 1989, 30 years ago, it's hard to believe it was not just the moment of the Tiananmen Square massacres and the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was a publication of a very prominent thesis by Francis Fukuyama, who at the time had just completed a stint as the head of policy planning at the State Department. Uh, and uh, Fukuyama uh, published an essay in the National Interest in Washington. It was published by a former CIS fellow by the name of Owen Harris. And Fukuyama's argument was that we had reached the end point of humankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy and market capitalism. And there was a widespread view throughout the 1990s and throughout the 2000s and even into this decade that China, as it embraced market economics, would not just become more prosperous, which it undoubtedly has, if you think about it, uh, in the last 40 years, 40 years ago, there was something like uh, nine out of 10 mainland Chinese living in abject poverty. Well, today, um, only one in 10 live in abject poverty, and that's largely due to market forces. So the argument was, and this was the Fukuyama argument, that the more China embraced markets, the more likely it was not just going to embrace more prosperity, but also become eventually over time more democratic, and its foreign policy would become peaceful and its rise would be benign. Um, but as we now know, uh, China has not followed the end of history script. Uh, <laughs> far from it. Um, and so the question tonight is, have we been naive about China? Um, is Australia's long-standing pragmatism, and this is putting differences aside to focus on overriding economic and strategic interests, has that pragmat is that pragmatism still tenable? To what extent does Beijing threaten Australia's national sovereignty? And how can we best preserve our political autonomy in a regional order that some say increasingly revolves around Beijing? Well, we have a terrific debate to flesh these issues out. I'm gonna introduce each speaker one at a time, or each panellist one at a time. First panellist uh, is uh, a former uh, senior advisor to the former foreign minister, uh, Julie Bishop. Um, he's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, one of Washington's leading strategic think tanks. He's also affiliated with the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. He's been published in many international publications, including The National Interest that published um, Francis Fukuyama and also the American interest. And he's also a former fellow here at the Center for Independent Studies. And we're delighted to welcome him back. Ladies and gentlemen, John Lee. <laughs> Our next panelist is the director of the Australia-China Relations Institute here in Sydney at the University of Technology, Sydney. He's one of our nation's leading proponents of close relations between Canberra and Beijing and he's been a prolific performer on various ABC television and radio outlets, including my own radio national show, Between the Lines. Ladies and gentlemen, James Lawrenson. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this evening's proceedings, who happens to be uh, the convener of our new program on China and Free Society. She's been a long-standing supporter and member of the CIS family. Ladies and gentlemen, Sue Windybank. Thank you. Over to you, Sue. Thanks, Tom. Let's kick off with that optimistic um, time back in the 1990s and 1980s, uh, Fukuyama's end of history thesis, and this expectation that 
as China became more prosperous, it would become more liberal and more democratic. Um, people said we were naive, but when you look at the example of Taiwan and South Korea, they economically liberalised and then later they politically liberalised and they became vibrant democracies. So, John, what makes China so different? Well, there's, there's no easing into this uh, event tonight, is there, Steve? <laughs> um, if you look at the 1980s when China first began its reforms, I think the optimism was, um, was justified. Um, there were debates about democratic tr transformation in China. Mm. Um, within the Chinese Communist Party, there were what we'd call liberals um, in quite prominent positions. And of course, we know 1989 occurred. Uh, after 1989, and particularly from about the mid-1990s onwards, I think that's where we have been naive. Um, we thought there was only one way of doing capitalism. Mm. The Chinese learnt very quickly that if we do capitalism the way that Francis Fukuyama wants the world to do capitalism, what Fukuyama said would happen would probably happen. So what the Chinese learnt from their own experiences from the rest of East Asia and from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe is that you cannot allow the creation or you cannot encourage the emergence of a powerful, genuinely independent middle class. So you, you look at the political economy of China now, the middle classes tend to be the strongest supporters of one party rule. And that is because they are the primary beneficiaries of one party rule. Um, so that is the lesson that you do not tie the middle, the futures of the middle class. Um, a, you, not t you do not bring that away from the party, you bring that closer to the party. From that point of view, we're a naive. That's been occurring, I think, for 15 years. Um, we should have seen that coming. Um, so in the last 15 years, I think we have been uh, naive, to use that word. Jump in quickly. I, th I think we need to be a bit of careful with the framing. Of this. I'm going to just push back on the framing a bit. Um, I'm not so sure conventional... It was a conventional hope that mm. political um, economic prosperity would lead to a liberal democracy. But I'm not sure the evidence ever actually supported that framing. Um, I mean, I think my own academic colleagues in Australia, there's been for decades, there's been Australian academics saying, look, this idea that uh, developing countries are on a linear trajectory to, from whatever they were towards a liberal democracy is a bit silly. I mean, why would they? If you look around in the region, Southeast Asia, you'll see a whole bunch of different countries. You mentioned South Korea and Taiwan. Well, okay, they actually reach quite high levels of economic development um, before they moved away from authoritarianism. Um, you've got other countries, Indonesia, Philippines, that moved to, away from authoritarianism early, earlier, but once they've moved away, they've actually struggled economically. So the whole range of countries, I, I think, you know, in reality, we're dealing with samples of one. Every country has their own political economy, their own institutions. So I'm not so sure I'd buy the thesis of Henry. Can, can I quickly make an a intervention on that? Um, oh. Fukuyama, Fukuyama made the mistake of just focusing on democracy as in a pers person has the right to vote for multi-parties. If you had focused, for example, on liberal institutions, rule of law, property rights, um, rights of individual rights, rights of the private sector, etc., then the evidence is quite strong that, first of all, to get to a high-income economy, you do generally need these institutions. And once you have these institutions, uh, representative democracy tends to follow. That evidence, I think, is quite strong. Um, but if you just focus on democracy being one person, one vote, then I don't think there is a connection between um, pure democracy or just one person, one vote um, and the um, emergence of prosperity and a brighter future, et cetera. You mentioned that there's you know, a diversity of schools of thought in China and you mentioned liberals within the communist, Chinese Communist Party itself. It's certainly not a monolithic block of single voices. What's happened to, to some of these um, people now? They, under Xi Jinping, they seem to have been cowed into silence. Some have even been put in jail. People are losing their teaching jobs. But despite this kind of crackdown, every now and then you hear some grumblings. There's criticism of Xi Jinping and the path that he's taken China down, which is not the only path. It's not inevitable. Do these grumblings amount to some kind of serious cracks in, in Xi's authority? Uh, John, I'll hand that over to you. Uh, well, she, since in the last five years, has put around two million uh, party officials in jail. And 
these are not low down people. There's, he's put hundreds of um, elites in jail, including princelings. Now that tells me that he is insecure, not secure. Mm -hmm. And last year when he effectively paved the way to appoint himself president for life, that tells me even more that he's insecure because you, my reading of that is that you do that to protect yourself because once mm -hmm. you leave office, he's got a hell of a lot of enemies out there. Now those voices that you're talking about, I think a lot of liberals have been purged out of the system. Um, however, when things don't go right, for example, trade wars the United States or pushback against the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, those voices sort of tend to emerge from the woodwork. Mm. Yeah, when you make yourself the chairman of everything, you're also responsible for everything. So when things don't go well, well, it's on your shoulders. Look, the, <clears throat> the Communist Party was very careful after Mao to put in a system where there was a collective leadership and collective decision making. And it was precisely to avoid the emergence of a leader not unlike Xi Jinping. So it has this kind of personalisation and concentrated concentration of power in Xi Jinping himself, as you say, he now has responsibility for everything when he's the chairman of everything. Does that make the PRC a less predictable actor on the world stage? And if all the incentives are to conform and not to inform, basically not to speak truth to power, is there a risk of miscalculation or does the margin for error increase? Yeah, I think when you shut down that communication, which has certainly been happening, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. You'd certainly want your central government to be getting the best available information. It's not clear that in China that is happening. So that's a concern. Um, I'm not so sure, though, that um, the personalisation of power makes it necessarily more unpredictable. I mean, there's a couple unpredictable presidents in the world right now, and they're not all <laughs> living in China. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't tie unpredictability to the Chinese Communist Party. However, there are checks and balances in the United States. Well, we were told that, weren't we? We were told that it's all OK. Behind Trump, there is mm -hmm. A, B and C. Well, they're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was listening to the new US ambassador in Australia just after he arrived the other day, and he was asked what could be the consequences of a China-US trade war for Australia. Uh, of course, we're worried that China may buy more iron ore, <laughs> gas um, from the US, and that would mean less Australian exports. And his response to us was we'd better keep our fingers crossed. That was, that's a direct quote. Now, I don't, I don't feel comforted by that. <laughs> Pre Presidents of the United States have, clear, have uh, powerful executive privileges, but you know, I wouldn't compare the American system to the Chinese system. Sure. You know, we have to remember Donald Trump sweated over the Mueller report. Um, those sort of things don't happen in China. The point I'm making is that the president can't just... Um, create money out of nowhere to build his wall, um, you know, um, um, between America and Mexico. It's, it's your point, Sue, that as unpredictable as an individual in the White House may be, those institutions are there, which is precisely why I think um, there is a bit more comfort about um, America's future direction, mm. despite who they vote into power and compared to China's. Correct, correct. I think China today, um, a lot of NGOs, the media, have their access severely restricted, uh, whereas the West offers a relatively unfettered access to Chinese companies and actors. Is it hard time that there was a bit more reciprocity coming out of Beijing? Yeah, look, this is a good question. It's one, it sounds common sense, doesn't it? Well, why should we let them do stuff here if we can't do it there, right? I get the common sense argument. But, you know, I'm an economist and it's a strange argument as an economist because the reason we did things like lower our tariff wall or allow foreign investment isn't because we want to be nice to China. It's because we benefit from it, right? We do it for us, not for, our, not for the other partner. I mean, I'm all in favour of trade deals where you both decide to simultaneously lower barriers. Uh, but the best reforms we've had in Australia in economic terms have been the ones that we've just done. Um, so reciprocity, you know... I get it. And look, if, if it can be used as a means of, of lowering barriers in China and opening market access, which is if there's a good story to Trump, that's what we all hope it is. Um, but it is a very strange economic argument that the economics don't stack up. Uh, to me, reciprocity made sense when we were um, lowering barriers vis-a-vis um, -vis economies in Southeast Asia mm. or South Korea even or Japan. When it comes to an economy the size of China's, I think that does that that is a different kettle of fish because that has a different distortive effect on 
the global economic system compared to unilateral lowering of barriers in Vietnam or Indonesia or Malaysia or Thailand, which occurred uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Yeah, but I mean, look at the outcomes that we've got from lowering our barriers to China, right? Is there a bad story there? Last year, we exported $135 billion to China. Five years ago, we were worried that with the tailing off of the mining boom, that could be the end of the China story. Instead, what we've seen is new, period, new areas of demand, agriculture, tourism, um, you know, education. Um, so I think China has been a great story for Australia across the board. Uh, Australia does have... China has been a great story for Australia up till now, but we have a very different economic relationship with China than, than for example, European economies right. mm. or Japan or um, the United States. So, for example, if you look at what we export to China, it's commodities, agricultural products, tourism and education, the latter two where they come to Australia. It's very much an arm's length transaction. Mm. Now, if you start having supply chains that are integrated with China, if you start having... Um, value chains that are integrated with China as opposed to selling arm's length products, I think that's a very different kind of relationship and it becomes inherently more competitive and strategic as the Europeans and the Americans are discovering. Is that one of the reasons why there's quite a difference in debates between Australia and the United States where in the United States the business community, which was once one of the most passionate supporters mm. of engagement with China, has actually led the debate uh, about becoming more competitive with China, whereas I think... In Australia, you know, the business community is still very positive on China. Yeah, it is. And, and it's a not different pattern of economic engagement. So I certainly agree, Sue, mm. with your observation, but I think it also tracks over to the publics of both countries as well. Um, the Australian public are keenly aware that we export $134 billion to China. We, our largest, it's kind of ironic, given that, you know, in the U, the, for the US, China is their largest bilateral trade deficit. In the case of Australia, it's the precise opposite. Um, our trade surplus with China is our largest, and our biggest trade deficit is with the US. Now, as an economist, bilateral trade deficits and surplus don't worry any of us, uh, but I think they do for the Australian public, and I think we see that in the US. It does bother the US public, and Trump certainly, this bilateral trade deficit. Well, for us, it works in the opposite direction. Business people don't change their minds until they lose money, right? I mean, that's just a fact. James Packer used to love China until his executives got jailed, and then he's changed his tune in China. Same thing's happened with the United States. So I think the question then becomes... Are they justified in uh, blaming China um, mm. for loss of money? And that's where the re reciprocity and the various opaqueness of the Chinese system comes in. <coughs> James, you were talking about public opinion on, on mm. China before, but when it comes to foreign investment, well, look, Australian public has always been very ambivalent about foreign investment, particularly in land. Nice choice of words, <laughs> ambivalent, yes. <laughs> but uh, I think there was a Lowy poll last year which showed that nearly, I think it was three quarters of mm. the respondents said that Canberra was allowing too much Chinese foreign investment in real estate yeah. and agriculture. Mm. Should people be careful what they wish for? Because Australia does need foreign capital and has always needed foreign yeah. capital and investment. And how do we kind of reconcile and get the balance right between our need for foreign investment but also concerns about national security? Yeah, look, uh, I, on the record, I like the Lowy Institute, but that question is a dud question. Right? The question asks, do we allow too much investment from China? Do we have anyone from the Lowy Institute here? They don't ask it about any other country, right? So if you asked it about India or the US, I expect a high proportion of Australians would say, yes, we allow too much foreign investment from them too. At the Australia-China Relations Institute, we, we actually dug into the data in a much more detailed way. And the average Australian isn't as against Chinese investment as you would think. Um, so the issue, I think, is more about communication. What, what annoys um, Australian companies, of course, is when they get led to believe they're able to sell an asset and then at the last moment the Australian government cuts in and tells them they can't after they've spent million millions of dollars on advisory fees. I think we're getting better at that. The Critical Infrastructure Centre, for example, is, is a good start. John? Um, I haven't been, I have been critical of the Australian government in, in, in this context when it, because of the signalling aspect. I agree. There, there were quite a few deals where um, the Chinese buyer got to the very last, or well, the last stages, and it were basically told that this was not going to happen. Um, I, I think that um, you don't do it like that. You, you do it right from the beginning, and that's where I think you need a clearer set of rules. On things like real estate, look, if you're a house owner, you love Chinese buyers because your houses go Unless up. If you're, a house, you. if you're a house looking to buy in a market, sorry, if you're a house owner, you love Chinese, Chinese capital. If you're a house buyer looking to buy, you hate them. 
Um, instantly, two years ago, uh, we bought a house. When I walked into the auction, everyone thought I was Chinese. Heads dropped. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly have streamlined, I think, the processes for foreign investment. Mm. It, was, it was a bit all over the shop. Yeah. Um, but the ban on Huawei um, is still reverberating um, and having an impact on the bilateral relationship. Do you think that was well handled in terms of signalling? Well, I tell you what, I thought if you saw the press release uh, that the government released, uh, I thought that was a great press release because mm. it, you know, even though it was pretty clearly about it on Huawei, they didn't actually put it in those terms. They said, you know, this, this, these uh, justifications apply equally to all countries. Um, that said, there were a couple things about the way it was, not so much from the government officially, but things that leaked out afterwards. For example, afterwards we found out that shortly after the government made the decision, Malcolm Turnbull got on the phone to President Trump to let him know that that's what we'd done, right? So I don't think that was the smartest thing because it kind of made it an alliance issue rather than something about that Australia had independently come to on the advice on the of its own security agencies in its national interest. Then you have these leaks as well, presumably from our security services to certain Australian journalists talking about um, members of the Five Eyes dining over Nova Scotian lobster, I think, and fine Rieslings in Canada talking about how they're going to gang up and, and get tough on Huawei. Um, again, you know, that sort of is a bit... It's not, I can't blame the government for that, but I don't think that's the way you handle it because it sort of raises concerns um, that the, the security agencies are wanting to run the show and that's not really the way we want it to be done. Could we learn from Japan, John, which um, announced their decision with far less fanfare when it came to Huawei? Um, First of all, just to step back a bit, you know, when at the time when I was in government, the two things that the Turnbull government did, which annoyed the Chinese the most, one was the foreign interference legislation mm -hmm. and, and the debate, but, but particularly the determination to push through legislation. And the second was about the Huawei, or the, the 5G stuff more generally. Look, there's always things that can be handled better, but I, I can't imagine a situation where the Chinese would have been happy. I don't think it is really possible to do it in such a way that the Chinese would not have been annoyed with Australia. Um, with the analogy of Japan, I think Japan is a great model. But if you look at what Japan has did, when particularly modern Japan, when Shinzo Abe came into power the second time, 2012, 13, you look at the first, first few things he did. He reinterpreted the constitution to allow collective self-defence, which essentially was allowing the Japanese for the first time to join military actions with allies, right? Who would, could it potentially be? North Korea or China. Japan wanted to, buy, to sell submarines to Australia, which is quite a uh, significant strategic move. Once again, potentially against China. Japan bought F-35s. Once again, why would they need them for? Mm. It's not South Korea in the long term, it's China. The point I'm trying to make is that um, the Shinzo Abe government just went ahead and did what it thought it should do, it pushed hard, it set those boundaries, and it's in the last two years of the last year where Japan and China have come to accommodation. The point I'm trying to make is that optics can always be better, but the more important thing is to push where you think your national interests are, condition other countries to accept those lines or those anchor points that you set for yourself, and then manage the relationship. Do you agree that we're, yeah. we're trying to see how far we can actually push in asserting our national interests? We are trying to see how far we can go with that. Yeah, look, this might surprise you, mm. but I actually have a lot of commonalities with John on this point. I, I don't think, when I look at the last 18, 12, you know, 24 months, the biggest problem for me hasn't actually been policy. Um, can we introduce our own foreign interference legislation? Of course we can. Can we block Huawei if that's the advice of our security agencies? Of course we can. Right? I, but I do think the rhetoric got way out of kilter and that, that was actually the source of a lot of problems. For example, um, I've had a lot of conversations with Chinese diplomats and I can tell you not a single one of them, not one, has com ever complained to me about Australia introducing the foreign interference legislation, not one. Right? In fact, they've said to me, we understand it's every country's sovereign right to do that. There was an article in the China Daily where they said Australia's banning foreign donations. Good idea, <laughs> right? But what they did not appreciate was when the, when the legislation was being introduced, and I'm talking Malcolm Turnbull standing up at a press conference and on the floors of parliament when he singled China out. 
Um, so I, my view and my reading of my interactions with Chinese diplomats was that if we just have had it gone ahead and introduced it, um, we wouldn't have had nearly the problems we have had. A quick comment. Uh, I think Malcolm Turnbull's comments in Parliament were provocative and they were necessary. Having said that, I was in government at the time the legislation was prepared and introduced. Behind closed doors, the Chinese were saying very clearly to us, government to government, if you do this legislation, this is an insult to China and will harm the bilateral relationship, which is just something we had to do. And I guess from my point of view, there was no way of getting around it. China was going to be annoyed. But yes, there are better ways of handling how, how you do that. As the PRC becomes more autocratic and repressive at home, the differences between Australia and China are growing, particularly the values gap, the divergence in values. Tom mentioned earlier, you know, that successful era of Howard era style pragmatism where we put our differences to one side to focus on common economic interests in particular. Do you think that's still tenable now, given the direction that Xi is taking China down? Um, I do, largely. Um, you know, the values between Australia and China aren't going to line up, right? Have we got the message yet? <laughs> right? We're not going to have common values with China and across a whole range of areas. But I tell you what does line up often and big is interests, mm. right? And we can see that as well. If you look at our economic relationship, um, those interests are actually becoming you know, common, more common and more big. Look at the latest issue in, around trade. Well, the truth is, on international trade right now, if you listen to what the Australian government's saying, it's actually got far more in common with China than it does with the US, right, in terms of our interests in, for example, a multilateral rules-based trading system. The US is not a fan at the moment. China still is, and certainly the Australia, Australia is. So our interests still align. I, I would say that Howard, uh, John Howard existed at, existed at a very different time and he could do what he did, but he couldn't do what he did then now. For example, when you had the Taiwan Straits crisis in 1996, all America had to do was send an aircraft carrier, China mm -hmm. back down. That's not going to happen now. Um, back in Howard's day, even when he lost office um, in 2007, China hadn't done what it had done in the South China Sea. It hadn't done what it had done in the East China Sea. It hadn't engaged in those sorts of acts of economic coercion against various countries like Japan, South Korea, etc. Um, not all of the BRI I pose, but it hadn't rolled out aspects of BRI, which I do think um, we ought to be concerned about. The point I'm making is that China is not just more powerful today or, or, or a larger country, but it's much more assertive today. Um, I, don't I don't actually think she has changed China's objectives. I think they're always mm. there. But I think she has fast forwarded and pushed the envelope, um, taken on more risk, if you like, and, and that has changed the environment. You mentioned the South China Sea <clears throat> and I mean, China built up all these islands, it said it wasn't going to militarise them and then it went and hit it, did it. Mm. Um, it does use economic coercion against other countries with competing claims mm. in that area um, to basically punish governments. Those policies don't align with Beijing. Does that pose a threat to the kind of open and non-discriminatory trading system that the region's benefited from over the past well, 70 years? Were China to become uh, the dominant player in the region? Yeah, so actually I've got a paper coming up on this exact topic, so I'm happy to share that with you in a couple of weeks. But the issue of economic coercion is an interesting mm. one for me as an economist. Um, th so first of all, there's no doubt that China does use economic coercion. So we've run through our list of, um, you know, Japan rare earth metals in 2010, Philippine bananas, Norwegian salmon, ch uh, Korean tourists. Uh, but do you notice that those examples of economic coercion, we all know them, right? Japan, Korea, Philippines, Norway. You know why we all know them? Because we keep repeating the same examples over and over again. Right? If you look at the extent of China's economic coercion, I think we often exaggerate it. Um, and that's where we need to be a bit careful. Look at the case of Australia. Uh, last year there, was talk, there were reports of Australian wine and beef being held up at Chinese ports. We've had similar talks around coal. Well, guess what? Last year our exports of beef and coal and wine absolutely skyrocketed. So while there's concerns, I'm not dismissing them because, as I said before, China does use economic coercion. Um, it doesn't do so willingly, willy-nilly and it doesn't do so particularly often. Why? Well, because it would hurt its own interests economically 
and also its reputation. Um, and I tell you what, that's not going to be successful either. I mean, why would Australia roll over on an issue like the South China Sea and suddenly say international law shouldn't apply? Um, because well, Sam Dastyari nearly well, did. Sam Dastyari, and, and that's a good point. I hope we get into that a bit <laughs> later. So that's one of the points I often make. When we're thinking about Chinese interference, uh, let's look at the effect of it. And in the case of Australia's foreign policy, I think that's a great example because we had these stories of Chinese political donations undermining our sovereignty by buying our politicians. Well, what is the end effect? We had one junior opposition party senator contradicting his own party's position on the South China Sea, and it certainly had no impact on the Australian government's position. So if it was interference, gee, it was a pretty poor attempt. More effective than Chinese actual Chinese acts of coercion, economic coercion, is the implied threat it can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a society, it doesn't require a policeman to say, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to arrest you. It just requires policemen to say, I could arrest you any time. That's what China does very effectively. So for example, I, I, I know from the inside um, that when Australia undertakes certain actions that Chinese don't like, they're quite explicit about implicit threats, if I can put it that way, that this will damage the Chinese-Australia economic relationship. And everyone knows what that potentially means. Now, for a country like Australia, where we're quite a competitive economy, where we can access um, global capital markets fairly, fairly easily, that's OK, because we can deal with that. If you're a country like um, uh, Cambodia, or if you're a country like, uh, even a country like Thailand these days, the Philippines, I think that kind of threat carries a bit more weight. But to your broader question of does it affect the global economic rules-based system, oh, China would obviously have to... Um, if China went so far as, as to change the global economic rules-based system through coercion, I agree that it would harm itself to, to a large degree. So it couldn't actually do it that way. Personally, I think that the greatest threat of... Um, yeah. China to the global economic system is the nature of its political economy where things are cross-subsidised, um, where competition act isn't the way, um, isn't set up the way it's meant to be. When you become the largest trading nation in the world, largest manufacturing nation in the world, and you have, it's not a command economy, but it's certainly a cross-subsidised party directed economy. I think that is actually a greatest threat to what I would call the rules-based economic system. And isn't it ultimately possibly a greater threat to China itself? Or <coughs> is the PRC going to prove everyone wrong again about top-down direction of the economy in, in terms of becoming a technological superpower and, and the Made in 25 initiative, et cetera, et cetera, which is very heavy on quantitative targets, heavy subsidies, top-down planning, et cetera, instead of allowing market forces to determine allocation of resources? Look, just one observation for me this. I think it's interesting. We, we spend a lot of time worrying about China's state-owned enterprises and we say because that's unfair competition. Yet at the same time, we also say that Chinese state-owned enterprises are, are the sources of greatest inefficiency in China's economy. Well, how does that match up? Why are we so worried about state-owned enterprises when we used to have them and we got rid of them because we thought they were inefficient, right? So it seems to me that we're not actually having a crisis about China's state and enterprises. We're having a crisis about our own decisions and whether we got it right. Same with industrial policy, right? Where, oh, it's, you know, the Chinese are using industrial policy to create this hyper-competitive technology sector. Well, hang on, what do we know as economists? Didn't we stop trying to pick winners in Australia and the US because it didn't work? Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think we're having a crisis about our own decisions rather than about what's actually happening in China. Uh, my view is that China's playing a different game. It is true that state-owned enterprises, as James said, are very inefficient. For example, they're about three times more inefficient on most measures than ch private Chinese companies. The reason why I have a concern with them, and I think the reason why many countries do, is that China's playing a different game. They, they don't care so much that their, their state-owned enterprises are inefficient. They're prepared to wear so-called transaction costs, and what they really want is market share. So what they're trying, if you take Made in China 2025, the blueprint isn't we want the most efficient companies in the advanced technology space. The blueprint is we want to dominate export markets in the advanced technology sectors. They don't really care um, whether they do so efficiently. 
but they want to effectively control market share. So I think that's more to worry. Now, will that work? I personally don't think it will. Um, but at the same time, that's a concern I think I have and, and many, many other countries have. So could James. you just give me 15 seconds? So my answer to that would be, we'll look at the data. If you're worried about Chinese exports occupying market share, which firms in China are winning export market share? And they're not state owned enterprises. Right? They're China's private enterprises. And you know what else? They're foreign-based companies in China. They're the ones that are growing China's market share in export markets. You look at SOEs, they're actually abject failures in terms of their export share of China's total exports. So I don't think they're doing a particularly good job. A five-second response. The, <laughs> the private sector companies that are doing well in China, like Huawei, are national champions. They're effectively treated, treated as state-owned enterprises given the advantages of state-owned enterprises. So yes, they are private from that point of view, from, from the point of view of how, how the shareholding is structured, but they're effectively treated as state-owned enterprises. Look, China's going through a very difficult transition. It's trying to lift itself out of the middle income trap. Um, to use the old cliche, it's trying to become rich before it comes old. But it faces some really massive internal challenges, not just the demographic issue, which as we know is very difficult to turn around uh, quickly. To my mind, the, the, uh, Beijing has still not decided yet what model they're going to replace the old export and investment-led model that powered growth for the past 40 years. And I'd like to ask you, in some ways, is this Belt and Road Initiative, which is Xi Jinping's flagship project, uh, is, is that in some ways buying some time for China as it makes this decision about uh, control and a new model? And in some ways, are the domestic drivers of that initiative more important uh, in terms of exporting this old model um, into Central Asia and elsewhere than some of the grander strategic rationales that we hear a lot about? Yeah, I think there certainly is domestic drivers for the Belt and Road. There's no doubt about that. Um, but... I think China's already made quite a lot of progress in switching its growth model. Um, you know, last year, 76% of China's growth came from consumption. In fact, exports haven't contributed to Chinese GDP growth for nearly a decade. So, um, you know, we've got to catch up. Um, and, you know, I remember five years ago, there was serious debate about whether China could actually be creative, could actually be innovative and move up, move up the value chain. I don't think anyone's arguing about that anymore. I was talking to a business colleague last night and he was saying, you know, if you, if you, if you want to be involved in high-tech manufacturing, there is no better place than Shenzhen, right? The, the ecosystem there is world-class. So I think this idea that just because you have constraints on freedom of speech, they may, that may somehow prevent China being a technology superpower, my view is that argument's already been won. And like it or not, I think it's been won in China's favour that, yes, you can move up the value chain even with those constraints in place. Um, I view China's greatest domestic economic problem, if you like, as um, the uh, need to um, redistribute national wealth. I'm not talking about a socialist model. What I mean by that is if you look at the last 15, 20 years of Chinese economic development, the um, proportion of national wealth into the coffers of corporations have increased about twice the rate of GDP. Um, the proportion of national wealth in household incomes is about half that of GDP in terms of the growth. The point I'm trying to make is China is getting older. Um, it's, it is getting a, a larger middle class. Um, the political economy that China has privileges um, corporations and a productive capacity of, of the economy, and a lot more needs to be put into the household and private wealth of the country. If China can't do that, I think it's going to suffer um, something very close to what Japan has experienced, which essentially is you keep pouring money into pro uh, producing activities, but doing so inefficiently. Eventually, you don't get a Lehman Brothers collapse because the, different, the system's different, but you get a structural gradual slowdown. And China, I don't think, has the social and civil institutions to deal with that in the way that Japan has, for example. Japan was already rich when that yeah. scenario began. China is not. 
Right, but that also means that it's relatively easier mm. for China to catch up. You know, we, we, we need to remember that while China's got the world's second largest GDP in per capita terms, it's only about a third of the US. So in economics, we have this theory of convergence. When you're a long way behind the frontier, it is easy to catch up. Um, so I think China, for all the constraints, for all the fears about debt and all these other areas, um, I'm still pretty bullish on the Chinese economy. And Gordon Chang's book, The Coming Collapse of China, was published in 2001. Um, you know, we're coming up to the 20th anniversary soon. Mm. And I've been looking at China's economy for the last 20 years, and I've seen a steady stream of people. I don't mean to be flippant. And of course, past performance isn't a guide to fu future performance. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think it does show us that Chinese growth is far more robust than we might think. And again, I'd actually point to China's private sector in this. We spend a lot of time talking about inefficient state-owned enterprises, uh, but China's private sector is incredibly competitive. In fact, I remember a study by the, Wall the OECD not so long ago where they looked at measures of market concentration, so measures of competitiveness across a whole range of, there's about 400 industry sectors. Guess what? Levels of competition in China were actually higher than they were in the US. Um, so they've got a very, very competitive base to their economy as well. And even if China were to stagnate, it would still be an extremely large economy, right? Um, let's move on to some strategic issues. Uh, there's the leading strategic analyst in Australia, Hugh White, has argued that Australia is eventually going to move away from America in the region and move closer into China's strategic orbit as China's power grows and as American power declines. John, I can ask you, how plausible do you think that is? Because a lot of the, con the angst in Australia about China's regional ambitions is caught up with this idea that an authoritarian power could displace a demo demograph I mean, demographic, a democratic power as the regional hegemon. So how plausible do you find his, his thesis? <coughs> Hugh's white thesis is compelling if you reduce, which he does, the region to the United States, China and Australia and eliminate all other players. If you just have the United States, China and Australia, then Hugh's white thesis makes a lot more sense because China's, in a relative terms, getting more powerful, the US is relative terms getting less powerful. You know, that tends to, to change the gravity, the strategic gravity of things. But that's not how our region looks like. If you look at the other significant countries in the region, Japan, um, much of Southeast Asia, in, Indonesia, Singapore, India, which is, which is having more of an impact in the you know, Pacific region and, and in, in East Asia, these countries are not making those sorts of choices that Hugh is suggesting. Um, so in Hugh's construct, it's compelling, but if you look at the region, that's not what's happening. If you look at Australia specifically, Australia has essentially made a choice. If we do not um, integrate our defences for defence forces with the United States, we don't really have a defence force, or we don't really have a capable defence mm. force. We've actually made our choices. We've made them decades out. Now, whether it's a wise choice, obviously um, there'll be disagreement, but I think we've actually made that choice. Is that what this concept of the Indo-Pacific is all about, which initially came from the Japanese Prime Minister, but is this an attempt to try and expand the strategic space um, and to create more room for China at the same time. And as you say, to acknowledge that there are other players in the region that could form a kind of coalition of soft balancing, if you like, not containment, but soft balancing against China, a kind of hedging strategy, in other words. Um, I would say from a strategic policy point of view, it's a response to what China's doing. I mean, China essentially has an Indo-Pacific strategy. The Indian Ocean has become far more important to China over the last... Uh, five or six years uh, compared to before. Um, the Indo-Pacific strategy also brings in the importance of India. Now, who knows what India will be? Um, but India will be relevant. In, in, India will not be an ally of the United States. That's just not in the Indian strategic culture. But India will have a particular weight which will prove, I think, troublesome for China. Now, for those looking to counter or balance um, Chinese power in a region, it makes sense to bring in players like India. But I think it just um, reflects the reality of, one, what China is doing or how China views the world, but two, it reflects the reality of, of um, the importance of sea lines, communications and trade routes, 
Um, and, and three, India's looking east and we're increasingly looking north and west. So that's just, that's, that's a reflection of that. Isn't China basically behaving like every other rising great power, including the United States in the past, that as its power grows, <clears throat> its, its definition of national interest increases and it tries to establish a sphere of influence to protect those interests, which is entirely legitimate. So isn't it basically doing in our region what the United States did back in the 19th century with the Monroe Doctrine? Well, let's take the South China Sea as an example, right? Because that's the one that everyone talks about of China being aggressive and expansionist, right? And we were told that the thing we had to worry about there was that China was putting those outposts in the South China Sea and that could threaten our trade routes, right? Now, that is a patently ridiculous suggestion. Why? Because what trade flows through the South China Sea? Trade with China, right? So that China's not going to stop its own trade. But does China want to protect its own trade? Absolutely. Jeff Raby made a great comment, the former Australian ambassador to China. Um, he talked about China being a constrained superpower. And he made the point, don't forget, we worry about our vulnerability to economic coercion from China being directed at us. And said, have a think about it from how it looks from China's perspective. They are utterly dependent on international markets for, war, for, for, for raw materials. And a lot of that, nearly all of it, throws, flows through the South China Sea. So, you know, I don't, I think South, the South China Sea is, uh, I think Julie Bishop handled that perfectly, by the way. I think she did a great job. Australia has to call it out. It's clearly in contravention to international law. But getting back to your point, should we be surprised? Not really. Um, that is how we would expect great powers to act when they see their interests being threatened. And of course, just to put an exclamation mark on that point, uh, the US, of course, is asking China to respect international law as defined by UNCLOS and the US refuses to sign UNCLOS. So that tells me quite a lot. How much more time have we got, Tom? Five more minutes. Um, let's, let's get back to the Australian government for the moment and this whole um, interference debate. Uh, basically, China is now attempting to kind of control the narrative or its, its image abroad the way it does at home. And the way it often does that abroad is by reaching into countries and silencing critics through intimidation and other pressures uh, or threatening family members at home. And I, I know that the Chinese-Australian community here have felt those pressures quite keenly in some Chinese-Australian media. And it's also reaching beyond that traditional focus on the diaspora. And it's reaching, when I say is the, the Chinese Communist Party or actors associated with it, um, into our universities, um, our media, and to a certain extent um, the political system. Now there's a legitimate public diplomacy that occurs out in the open and you know the source. But this is a very new area for liberal democracies. It's a grey area. It's quite ambiguous. When, when is the line crossed and when is the line not crossed? You don't want to overreact, but you don't want to underreact either because if left unchecked, it could potentially, the net result could be the erosion of, of sovereignty, as Tom was talking about earlier. It, it's a difficult area because in a liberal democracy like ours, particularly a multicultural liberal democracy, um, we, uh, we are not certain how we respond when other countries emphasise race. So when a Chinese, when a Chinese government says to the Chinese diaspora, Actually, you're one of us. You're not. We that that is anathema to our system, um, and that's something that um, has to be taken seriously and has to be countered. Now, on Chinese influence and and you know, I think we've got to be very careful about distinguishing between interference, which is a much mm -hmm. higher standard, covert influence, and attempts at influence. All countries attempt to influence or put their points of view across. It's interference in our processes and its covert in, in, uh, influence, which, which I think we need to be careful about. Yeah, and I guess the thing that, you know, these issues, you know, we, we've seen reported, um, Marie, I hope you don't mind me singling you out, but, um, you know, this is an example of, a, of an independent Chinese language media publication that came under um, direct pressure, that is inappropriate. I mean, we, we, no one's going to stand up and say, that's okay, right? I mean, that needs to be, we need to protect those sorts of outlets. Um, at the same time, we need to protect uh, 
Australians of Chinese descent from being unfairly tarnished and, and, and treated as though they are, you know, as though they are spies. And I can tell you, I've had a lot of Chinese Australians tell me that. It's not hard to see how it happens. Take a look at Clive Hamilton's book last year, right? Silent Invasion. He cites two sources for the uh, percentage of Chinese Australians who are loyal to Beijing first. He says it comes between 10 to 40 percent. We'll do the numbers. That's more than 200,000 Chinese Australians. So that's a lot of loyalty, doubts over loyalty being cast over the Australian population. But when you press him, when he was pressed to reveal those sources, he said he asked two friends. They took an educated guess and he thought it sounded plausible. Now, that is shocking. Right. So I think we need there's clearly cases of Australians of Chinese descent. We need to protect from the Communist Party. And there's clearly some Chinese of uh, Australians of Chinese descent that we need to protect from people like Clive Hamilton. I think we've got time for one more question. We've got you, you talked about pressure. We've got a new government. Um, well, we go to the polls next month. I don't think that has the date been announced yet. It has. It has <laughs> finally. Yeah, the 18th. Great. I'll be here. Um, so this new government, uh, this Ingang government, is going to come under a lot of pressure for, from Beijing, no matter which party wins the polls, uh, to reset the relationship, but things can't go back to the way they were. Uh, and their resolve will be tested very early on in the piece. John and James, what would be your advice to the new government? You go first, John. <laughs> um, as, as you mentioned, Beijing will offer a reset, and a reset in China's terms means let's, re, let's Australia revisit some of those policies that China doesn't like, and we will have a much better relationship. My advice is essentially the analogy I raised with Japan, just set where your lines are, all um, remain strong with them, manage your relationship, in a sense condition China to expect that what, where our lines are. You've got to be consistent as well, but expect where our lines are. Um, and, and, you know, a, a decent relationship with China is possible. I don't think it's ever going to be a relationship of genuine trust, but a decent relationship is possible. Sorry to disappoint the debate, but I largely agree with John. So there's nothing wrong with laying down those clear, those clear markers. I do think probably the one thing I would add is it's very important that we do have uh, policy in this country proceed based on evidence and facts. Um, and I'm not sure that always happens. I had a report at the end of last year called Australia Talks China Do the Claims Stack Up and it examined claims that are made across a whole range of areas and there was often quite a big gap. Um, so look, let's make it, let's do that. Let's lay some markers in the set, in, lay down some markers, but at the same time, let's make sure those markers are based on clear evidence and facts. And let's make sure it's a bipartisan consensus. Thank you very much. We're yeah. now going to open up to questions. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if Hope we're going to be able to. Job. What I might do. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. What I might do is take two or three together. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you. And then you can answer them. I want to pick up the issue of Chinese influence and interference. Uh, when this issue really came to attention was during the Benelong by election, and one of the candidates in that uh, ele by election, Chris, uh, now Senator Christina Keneally, um, suggested that the debate was sort of questioning the loyalty of uh, 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 expatriate Chinese in Australia. And it was an also a theme picked up by former uh, Foreign Minister Bob Carr and also by former Race Discrimination Commissioner Tim Sapomasan. Now, I want to ask two questions. One is, do you think it is a dog whistle, this debate? Secondly, if it's not, how do we neutralise that claim so that it doesn't impede what is a legitimate debate? Okay, just get maybe hold that thought and get one question from the front here. <laughs> James. Wait for the microphone, um, James. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, assuming that you think that the uh, One Belt, One Road has a strategic um, and is a component and isn't just a, an economic project, um, its ambition is staggering. Uh, one of the consequences of the scale of that ambition is it involves uh, China directly uh, in, in uh, investment uh, terms and uh, in other ways in a very large number of countries. And some of those countries, uh, other empires have found pretty difficult places in which to operate uh, Central Asia. I think there are already complications emerging for the Chinese in Pakistan. Uh, do you think this is going to prove a significant uh, distraction for China 
having to deal with the strategic complexity of dealing with so many uh, interesting countries. I think we'll just we'll just go to answering those two questions. First of all, on the on the issue of um, um, racism, shutting down what is or, or accusations of racism, su shutting down an open and robust debate that we need to have response. Yeah, look, I often lament the lack of leadership around this issue. Um, when you read some of the media reporting on this stuff, it is truly shocking, I'm sorry to say. I mean, I, I particularly remember a headline on the front page of The Australian about the Western Australian MP Pierre Young, um, and the headline was that he was uh, serving on a Chinese suspected spy ship, when in fact the reality of it was that he was in the Australian Defence Forces, and the Australian Defence Forces put him on the ship. Um, you know, that sort of stuff, I think we do need some leadership to call that out. That's, I think that is dog whistling in a sense. Uh, but look, the other thing we can do is just make sure that Chinese Australians are truly represented. It, 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 when Chinese Australians get painted as agents of the Communist Party, it always surprises me in the sense that the reality is is the problem is the exact opposite. Because what we the problem is we don't have any Chinese Australian representation in federal parliament at all, and it extends to the leadership of our public service universities as well. Um, so I mean, that's one way to neutralise the race argument is when we actually see Chinese Australians taking leadership roles in proportion to their place in Australian popu Australia's population as a whole. Um, r raising the issue of Chinese influence is not in itself racist. There is no doubt that some commentators or some bloggers who raise this issue are dog whistling, but in a sense they're abusing the issue because it, it, it is a real issue and it doesn't mean we don't raise the issues because it's been misused by some. In terms of your question of, you know, how do we, uh, in a sense, avoid that situation where it becomes an us versus them, as in, you know, a Chinese Australian versus non-Chinese Australian. You know, when a government um, um, embarked on, on confronting this issue, I mean, one of the motivations was that they were getting private appeals from a lot of Chinese Australians that this was a problem. And... Part of the argument as well was that a lot of the Chinese Australian groups, the leadership uh, have been quite co-opted in various ways with the United Front, but the actual group of Chinese Australians have not, as in the members have not. So my suggestion would be to, in some way, to empower these other Chinese Australians, or the normal membership of Chinese Australians, to offer their views, because they are not agents of Beijing. Um, although some of the leadership of various organisations, of Chinese organisations, um, if they're not necessarily agents of Beijing that are highly sympathetic, but they're not there in leadership positions by accident. They have been um, incentivised or given help to, to get to those positions. But that, that would be my, my suggestions to, to empower those voices. Just a quick one, if I may, really quick. Yeah. If you were Chinese Australian right now, would you make a political donation? Would you feel confident? Great. Yeah. It's not about spy agent. It's uh, it's about uh, the coercion because Chinese has relatives in China. Mm. I personally, uh, I come across quite a few Chinese friends or uh, 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 colleagues actually. They changed their mind, they've been quiet once political things changed because they involved in the Chinese community, you call it a dance group or singing group or whatever, and uh, they toned the line of Chinese consular's line straight away. They were so scared that they need to go to China. So, and they even involved in the protest, protest to Dalai Lama because so-called uh, this Chinese uh, uh, Chinese NGO here, uh, activists talking about the Chinese uh, uh, welfare uh, organization, so dance club, end up in the end they he lead everybody go to protest Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. So that's from dance floor to the protest floor. Sure. So uh, you, you, uh, Clive uh, Hamilton, it's not a uh, not a lie. Actually, he. He, his source is quite valuable. I think that's he talking to the Chinese, where Chinese know what's exactly happened. Sorry. It's obviously a range of views mm -hmm. in Chinese. Uh, uh, there was a question about the Belt and Road. Road. Yeah. Just very quickly, uh, it is an ambitious project. My, my view is that Xi has overreached. Mm 
because he's pouring a hell lot of money in uneconomic projects in economies that will never make the return. But if you speak privately to a lot of state-owned enterprises who have been co-opted in the Belt and Road project, a lot of them don't want to do it. Mm. A lot of them have to go to um, um, expensive funding sources to effectively fulfil various political objectives. Now, having said that, I, I'm not saying we just sort of lie down and wait until, you know, it sort of implodes because there are some aspects of Belt and Road Project that do directly affect Australia's interests. So in the South Pacific, some areas in Southeast Asia. But I think we've got to be selective about aspects of the BRI that we oppose and counter. We don't just sort of, you know, um, we, we, we don't either just oppose the whole thing or um, just wait until it implodes on itself because that, that, that's not going to happen either. You got a quick comment to make, James? I'll go to more questions. No, let's go to more questions. Okay, one over here, one up the back there, and one right up the back. First. Hi. Um, I just have a question about. Um, <clears throat> I guess it's broadly to do with with. Um, um, I guess non-political Chinese inf influence, um, specifically in relation to education. So, uh, you know, there's. I guess a, there are a bunch of different considerations which circle around this but uh so i have in mind things like the confucius institutes um you know places particularly in universities uh, appointment of academics um coercion of academics um that seem to that seem to be a bit problematic right so if if you know taking the idea that i mean education is such a fundamental way in which we educate people about mm -hmm you know, foreign powers, the kinds of influences they have, that sort of stuff, right? Um, I mean, I so I teach law for a bit of context, right? And, you know, you, you, you know as a, you know, when you teach law that there are certain unwritten rules when you have Chinese students in your class, for example, right, that talking about stuff like Tibet or, you know, um, the Uyghurs, uh, all those sorts, you know, camps, that sort of stuff, the, the, the idea of the lack of rule of law in China, stuff like that. It's all a bit taboo and, uh, you know, people, I mean, international students will make complaints of lecturers who talk about that kind of stuff. Um, and so I just wonder what your, what your thoughts are about academic freedom in Australia um, uh, because there's a sense in which it's not really overtly political, right? It's not like, the, you know, there's no... I guess, oh. direct evidence that the Chinese government is telling these individual students, no, you must complain, right? Mm. Yeah. Or maybe it is, but so I'm just wondering what your, your thoughts about that are. Predilection for self-censorship. We'll just hold that okay. answer and <laughs> move to this question, question here and then up the back. Yes, sir? Uh, thank you. Yeah, look, you mentioned human rights uh, before, James, and I think that's... An, and the gentleman here has just raised that issue again. Mm. I spent the last uh, 19, 20 years helping, uh, liaising with the government, helping them try and understand the Falun Gong persecution in China. Now, if we talk about overt influence, the, the Communist Party has been very effective, not only uh, in silencing the Uyghur issue recently or Tibetan, Tibetans' uh, persecution, but also Falun Gong. Mm. And the Labour and Liberal Party are both don't want to talk about it. They won't raise the issue. So I think all these human rights issues are connected to rule of law. If we want to do business with China, rule of law, human rights are the foundation for having an ongoing sustainable relationship with China. So I'm just wondering if you'd like to address those issues of human rights. We'll hold that answer too and just go to this lady up the back for one more question. Yes? Um, actually, I have a few questions, but if you, oh, you only allow me to <laughs> ask one question, just one. one question. Yes. Um, about the private um, enterprises in China, because you mentioned that uh, the private and the businesses in China were competitive. And I'm wondering if you have ever done research on private companies in China. For instance, maybe you still think Hainan Airline is a private company, but now it's very clear Hainan Airline is closely associated with a powerful politician, and the main shareholder is a Chinese politician. So I'm wondering what you think about Chinese private enterprises. 
Okay, we'll take those questions. So let's go back to the question about self-censorship yeah, and so. academic freedom yeah. and Chinese students. So maybe I will take that because I'm okay. based at the university and have been for the last 20 years. So I think there's 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 some things around here that are genuine worries and there's other things. So we're talking about universities, right? But even within universities, there's some genuine issues and there's some that are not so serious, right? So, for example, uh, anyone who has worked in Australian university probably has had the experience of some Chinese students telling them that they're worried about speaking openly in class because they're worried that they may be monitored, right? So that's a genuine concern. That's a threat to academic freedom. Um, we need to do whatever we can to protect those sorts of students, those students in that situation. So there's some real genuine tough things we've got to deal with. At the same time, um, you know, I hear these reports as well about uh, Chinese students attacking Australian lecturers over things like saying, um, you know, Taiwan's a country. Well, we disagree with that. Now, I'm going to push back a bit on that because I think if you can't have that sort of discussion in a university, where are you going to have it? That's, I mean, I've had students come to me and say, James, you referred to Taiwan as a country. We don't believe it is. And OK, fine. So we just have the discussion. It's honestly, it's really not not hard to deal with. And in that situation, quite honestly, who's got the power? It's the Australian lecturer, right? The Chinese student doesn't have the power. I welcome them raising the issue. Now, this, what you have to be careful of is that the institution supports the lecturer, sure. And in this report I wrote last year, um, in every case except for possibly one, the institution firmly backed the lecturer. So, uh, you know, in that sense, I think that's a bit of a uh, you know, that's not a threat to academic freedom at all. We should be having those debates. If we can't have it in the university, we're never going to have it. Uh, let's get to that question about human rights. Like whether Australia tends to raise these issues behind closed doors as per custom and as per Beijing's preference, is it about time uh, with regard to the Uyghurs or even to the detainment of the Australian, Chinese Australian blogger that uh, the Australian government raised this publicly and loudly? You know, as a government, I think when you raise human rights, particularly of a large country like this, um, you always think of the costs and the benefits. And and I guess the, the general uh, bureaucratic attitude to these things is that we can't really change China's behaviour, so why do we bother do that? I would I would um I would differ with that view when it comes and, and you have to look at the scale as well of human rights abuses. I mean, I hate to say it, but um scale does matter when it comes to public um, comments by elected leaders. So, for example, w with respect to China, in the case of the Uyghurs, you know, the scale is such that it's not just a humanitarian tragedy, it goes to um, China's claims to want to seek regional and possibly global leadership. Those sorts of issues, I think, you have to raise. There's also a political incentive to raise in the sense that I do actually think that the Australian population expects our leaders raise these things. Um, once again, you don't want to overdo this, but this is another example of where it is important to condition China to understand where we stand on these things. And it's not just a symbolic thing. You know, for example, there's all sorts of pitch battles going on in the United Nations, for example, to redefine human rights. Mm. China wants to redefine human rights in such a way that isn't really recognisable to what we would see as human rights anymore. Those sorts of battles do need to be fought. And particularly when you have large-scale offences like the Uyghurs, Falun Gong as, as, as well, I do think it's important to raise. It's interesting that the Muslim world hasn't been more vocal in condemning the, right. Uyghur, mm. the Uyghur gulags. This lady at the back had a question about just how private is a private company in China with the spread of party cells yeah. throughout the organisational structure yeah. now and not just sitting there listening to things but actively starting to direct <coughs> decisions. Yeah. Um, so, look, I think it's always – China's a huge country, so it's always easy to find examples of companies that call themselves private, but they may in fact not really be. But I don't think that takes away from the broader, broader point that China really does have a huge private sector um, where the Chinese Communist Party isn't calling mm. the shots on a daily basis. So take the point, uh, but I don't know how much I'd generalise it. I think we've got time for two more questions and then Tom – uh, this gentleman at the front, sorry, and this lady over there. And once again, if you could, we'll, we'll hold the answers and hear both the questions. Yes, I, I'd, I'd like to put this to you and, and hear your comment on it. I admire your defence, uh, Professor Lawrenson, by the way. It's amazing. It's very Chinese. 
really is very good. <laughs> I'm Scottish. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll put this to you. That China is the Chinese Communist Party and the chairman of everything is a paranoid, illegitimate regime which is imposing a dystopian regime in China and is headed towards, in the long term, as Confucius said, doesn't matter how slowly you go, as long as you don't stop. And it is slowly headed towards eventually taking over the world, not in a way that we understand. No, no garrisons, you know, there'll be no Rudyard Kipling. Um, it What's will embrace. <laughs> it'll embrace the world. Mm. Am I right or wrong? Uh, first of all, I'm rather fond. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go to another question first? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, sure. Sorry. Let's get this lady sorry. Back. Mm. Um, thank you for this wonderful debate. I'm an educator, not an economist, but I'm a little concerned um, about how money seems to be calling the shots. And for things like foreign aid um, in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, example, Mauritius. Uh, selling out fishing rights in return for rights to the port and then those sorts of um, countries can't repay and then they're being railroaded into voting at the UN and other different uh, things that are happening. I'm concerned about that and also the human rights as an educator. I lived in Hong Kong and worked there for six months. Um, I find it really concerning about what's going on and I think it's got a lot worse since I was there. So I'd be interested in your comments and re I really value your input. Thank you. Okay, sure. Will China rule the world and, <laughs> and, and impose its dystopian, repressive, totalitarian yeah. surveillance state? On Gee, I hope I haven't given the opinion or the that I am a supporter of the Chinese Communist Party, right? My goodness, that's certainly... I am not. <laughs> I'm rather fond of democracy. And I think the Chinese government does things in Australia that need pushing back on. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is that when we push back, we have to make that push back based on facts and evidence. And it's also worthwhile considering alternative point of views. You talked about a dystopian um, vision. One of the one, common areas we see that is in the case of um, social credit, the social credit system in China. It's Orwellian, um, dystopian. That's fine. I've got concerns around it as well. So do some Chinese. But guess what? We don't get to decide what's OK for China. Chinese people do. And if you ask Chinese people what they think of the social credit system, I guarantee you they are overwhelmingly positive. Now, you may be recoil in shock at that, but that's the reality of it. So if you want to know, there's an academic journal article just last month, in fact, that, that explored this topic. So if we're going, here's my general point. If we're going to understand where China is now and where it's headed, for goodness sake, please stop looking at Washington and Canberra. Right? We need to look at the streets of Beijing and Chengdu. Right? That'll give us much better insights into where we're headed. John, do you want to take um, up the question about, well, Yeah, Chinese I'll sort of address both questions with, with the one answer. Uh, will China rule the world, but also the concerns you raise? You know, China does best in, well, first of all, this notion that China will prove more and more attractive, its model and its, and its processes and approaches and values to, to the world. China is most attractive in countries where civil societies are weak, um, where governments are corrupt, um, where institutions are compromised. And the point I'm trying to make is, if you look around the world, there are roughly 200 countries, there are about 40 countries or so that are classified as free with good institutions. There's about, um, you know, of, of those 160, around 55% are partially free and the rest are not free. The point I'm trying to make is that this is why um, there's, there's so much at play and, and this is why institutional building, not just democracy, one person, one vote, but institutional and civil society building matters because the countries that can decide for themselves and if necessary push back against China or any other country, they are the ones with strong institutions. Um, and I think we've kind of lost the motivation and the art of building institutions, particularly since post-1991. That's something I think we're trying to rediscover, but we haven't done that for about two decades. On the question about Chinese aid in the Pacific and 
undermining the rule of law um, with its conditions-free aid or, or getting... I'd love to talk about this. Debt trap diplomacy, right? That's what we hear, debt trap diplomacy. It's a great line, right? What, if, what evidence is there that it is in fact true? I can tell you the academic literature is pretty brutal on this and there is very, very little evidence, particularly in the Pacific. Um, some scholars at the ANU just two months ago looked all across the Pacific countries for evidence of debt trap diplomacy. They pointed to one country where it was possible and that was Tonga um, and they didn't even find that example convincing. It's an odd argument for an economist that you push debt on someone in the expectation that they won't pay it back. Um, that's not how loans usually work. Ladies and gentlemen, James Lawrence and John Lee and Sue Windybank. Thank you.